Hey everybody and welcome to my second of two videos on this the middle to maximum 7000 in the first video we looked at all the buttons of which there's tons uh, we're also going to look now at how to use all of this camera's functions and how to operate it so this is going to be a pretty in-depth video but at the end of it I hope you have a really good sense of how this camera works so first thing we're going to do is we're going to change lenses and the way that we change lenses is by finding this button right here on the side. We're going to push it and rotate the lens counter or anti-clockwise. Take that and set it off to the side there. We can grab a different lens and then we find the red dot on that lens. We line it up with the red dot on the mount. And then we turn it clockwise until it clicks into place. And now we have changed lenses. If you've ever seen any of my videos before, you know that I like to open up the film back and show you how the film works inside of it. With these autofocus cameras, we really can't do that, but I can show you how to load the film and explain what happens. To load the film, you simply slide it in this way. Now, because of this guide pin right here, you've got to put it in at an angle and rotate it in. And then there's a little spring on the bottom, which is a little bit wonky and makes it somewhat difficult to load it and close the film back. Now we're going to pull out a leader. Oh, that was too much leader. Okay, so load the film again. Now we pull out the leader until it reaches this red index right here. We want to make sure that the sprockets are lined up with the sprocket holes and that all of this is in place. And now we are set to close the back. So with the film in the camera, we're going to turn it on and now it's ready to go. So this film, so the camera's got film, we're ready to go, but we need to make sure that the ISO is set correctly. Now, if you're just going to take DX coded film, so this camera can read film DX codes. So if you're just going to take film and shoot it at the rated speed, you can just let the camera read the DX codes. These are the DX codes right here. If you want to change that, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna hold down the ISO button and now I can manually set the ISO to a different speed. The fastest speed being 6400 and the slowest speed being 25. So the ISO range that you can manually set on this camera is 25 to 6400, which is a pretty standard range. I'm gonna turn it off, I'm gonna lock it. You can't really turn this camera off. So I'm gonna lock it. Next thing we're gonna do is change the battery on this camera. So to change the battery, all you've got to do is grab your, your nearest um, Philippine peso, pe peso, or any other coin that's going to fit in the battery door slot right here. There we go. We're going to get it started. Now this camera had three different battery doors it could, that it could use. I only have this one, unfortunately, or else I'd show you the others. But the battery door comes off and you could get one that took a 2CR25 battery. This is uh, the battery BH70T. This is the best door you can get. If you can get one of these or if your camera has one of these, it's ideal because this battery has tons of charge and will last a very long time. There were also battery options for four AAA or four AA batteries. So the, the stock battery door that came with this camera was the BH70L and that used four AA batteries and with with the four AA battery door if you're using alkaline batteries you could run about 40 rolls of film if you're using NICAD batteries uh, 2000 milliamp hour NICAD batteries you could run about 30 if you're using really nice rechargeable 2450 milliamp hour Duracells, for instance, you could probably run about 40 to 45 rolls of film. So if you have rechargeable double A's that are nice, then the double the double A door is a fine option. There's also a battery holder called the BH70, and that used four double A cells, but it was an external holder and it increased the battery, the, the camera's size, but it functioned exactly the same way as the BH70L. There was also the the BH70S and that was for four AAA batteries and you could get fewer than 20 rolls of film for four AAA batteries. The last one of course is the 
BH70T and with the 2CR5 battery from scratch you can get about 60 rolls of film with this camera. So it's a pretty significant difference between the AA and especially between the AAA. So if you have the AA or AAA, you would just put those batteries in however they need to go in. But with a 2CR5, you just pop it in. And then with whichever door you have, you put it on the back of the camera. And then you simply screw this in. And this should screw in very easily. If it puts up a fight, uh, you'll want to back it out and make sure that you're not cross-threading it. But once you've hand-tightened hand it, then you just use your coin to finish it off, and you're in good shape. And that's how you change the battery. The Maxim 7000 has a standard hot shoe right here. You can use a Maxim Minolta flash or you can use a standard generic flash as well. Those work just fine. This has a flash sync speed of 1 1 25th of a second and it uses the X or the modern electronic flashes. So you could just walk into a, an electronics or a camera store and buy a standard shoe flash for this. Uh, if you ask for a Maxim or a Sony flash, you will get one that has their proprietary shoe type, which looks like this nonsense over here, and will not fit in this camera. So let's go through some of this camera's features, and I'll show you how to use different functions. So the first thing is exposure compensation. So I'm going to hold down the exposure compensation, and I can, can overexpose up to four stops or I can underexpose down to four stops, That's, which is a huge, huge range. This is good, plus and minus, for manually bracketing your images. So let's say you want to take a picture of this scene that you're looking at right now. We've got white highlights here and here. We've got some dark blacks of the camera, and then we've got this just generic neutral gray under in a lot of it. Well, this is a scene that a, a camera like this would have a hard time metering properly. So let's say it tells you you want to take a picture at 1 1 25th at f5.6. Now you're in program mode, you can't really change that unless you hold down the plus minus the, the exposure compensation button. Now I'm going to do one that's a one and a half stops underexposed. And now I'm going to take a second shot that is properly exposed. And now I'm going to take one that is one and a half stops overexposed. And you can see each time that the shutter, the shutter speed changed and we're in program mode right here. So you can use the plus minus the exposure compensation button to override your program mode setting or you can use it for exposure bracketing. One thing to bear in mind is that if you have your exposure compensation in effect, you can see the little minus sign above the, the film there and now the plus sign. If you see a minus or plus, that means that your camera is either over or underexposing the image as you know, as, as applicable with a minus or plus, and that you're not going to get a properly exposed image under most situations. I showed you the ISO dial. All you have to do is hold down the ISO button and then select your film speed to override the DX code reading mode button. The mode button changes what shooting mode you are in. Program, aperture priority, manual, shutter priority, program. Or you can go the other way as well by pushing the shutter button the other direction. So let's talk about what each of these modes do. Uh, program mode, the camera looks at the scene. The camera will look at the scene that you're seeing right now and it's going to say I've got the 70 to 35 lens or 35 to 70 lens on at 50 millimeters at f4. So I'm going to I'm going to use a shutter speed of, of let's say 30, 1 30th of a second. Okay. So it's going to make the decision for you about what your exposure should be. And you, you can only override it with exposure compensation. So let's try another one. Aperture priority. Now you can see now that we went to aperture priority. It says 5.6 and there's a triangle next to it. This mode allows you to change the aperture and then the camera will decide what the best shutter speed is. So by pushing the up and down button here, down makes your aperture a smaller opening up makes your aperture a larger opening. Up makes the number go down, down makes the number go up. <sighs> I won't lie, I would have done that differently if I was Minolta, but um, you know, whatever, it's kind of, that ship's kind of sailed. So the, here's the thing with this, f5.6, and as long as the LCD screen is visible, I can adjust the aperture. We're at f9.5 right now, 
let's let the screen go off. There we go. Now I'm going to hit this button. I'm going to push up a bunch to make the opening bigger. Who knows? It, it, by now it should be wide open, right? No. As long as the screen is off, your aperture button will not respond and it will not change your aperture. So it's just something to be aware of when you're using this that in order to act to activate the aperture control, you have to have to press the shutter button first. When we get into the other modes, the same is true for those as well. So aperture con priority allows you to change the aperture and the computer determines the best shutter speed. Full manual. Full manual is fantastic because it gives you tons and tons of creative control over your images. If you push these buttons on the top, it allows you to change the shutter speed in full stop increments only. Here we go. So this is the shutter speed control, these buttons on the top. I guess not technically in full stop because that went from 100 to 125th, but at any rate. Um, then the buttons on the side control the aperture. So this is how you would change your settings to whatever you want them to be manually. Now let's go to shutter priority mode. Now you can see the triangle is only next to 1 125th of a second. You can only control the shutter speed, not the aperture. And you'll see that it's flashing there, the 4. What that's telling you is that this lens cannot be any faster than f4, but that this shutter speed requires an aperture larger than f4, so you cannot take a proper exposure if the aperture is flashing. So I'm going to leave this in aperture priority because that's in, to my way of thinking, the best mode to shoot in. Let's go to drive mode. S is single shot. Every time you push the button, it takes a photo. Now if we go to drive mode, continuous, hold the button down and it will keep taking photos. If we go to drive mode ST for self timer, see that red light there? It's going to flash fast and now take the picture and you can see that it was counting down on the top of the screen as well so you could tell how much time was left if you were standing behind the camera. Really very well designed in terms of the information on the LCD with the self timer. I'm going to go back to single shot. Let's go to program mode and I'm going to adjust the exposure value here to make it one and a half stops overexposed. Now I'm going to hit program reset and it resets all of my settings. So anything, so when you what program reset does is in program mode, I don't want to have to get, I'm, I'm four stops overexposed here. Well, I got to take another photo here in a second. I don't want to have to go back in and, and undo four stops. So I'm just going to hold down program erase and it's going to reset that for me and go back to program mode. And so, so next thing let's do is let's go into a different mode and let's see what happens. I'm going to go to manual mode. Now I'm going to hold down program erase and let go and it takes me back to program mode reset. So if I need to get from one of the other modes to program quickly, just hold and release the P button right there and it will take me back to program. I, I mean, honestly, 99.99% of the time, program's not the best mode to be shooting in. So I would, I would suggest, especially if you're learning, to avoid using program mode because you won't get as good of a sense about how camera settings affect the result on film based on different lighting. So we've taken a bunch of pictures here. So let's talk a little bit about AEL and you saw that there's the AEL button on the back. What we're going to do is we're going to do this in program, uh, we're going to do this in aperture priority mode. In aperture priority mode I can change the aperture, okay? Now if I put my hand in front of the lens to block light from getting into it. Here we are at f5.6 for a quarter second. If I move my hand, it goes up to 1 30th. So I'm going to keep my hand in front of it and I'm going to push the aperture exposure lock button and let go. And you can see that the shutter time remains the same. If I release it, then it goes to 1 30th of a second. So you need to hold on to AEL for as long as required to take your picture. Now, how would we use this? Good question. So let's say that this represents a scene, okay? And we've got some, some gray here, gray here, and we've got these highlights and these dark areas. So you're gonna take a meter reading here for your center weighted your meter. And what the center weighted meter means is that this area right in here provides the majority of the metering data. So if you were metering this scene, this vast darkness 
would skew your metering data. And what that and what happens is your, your light meter sees the whole scene as being a flat gray, 18% gray, the same tone as this, this uh, drop cloth is. So if your metering data thinks that this black mass is gray, which it will, then it's going to give you a shutter speed that will try to make this black mass gray. That's going to make these white areas completely white, these gray areas very white. So. I know that this is a gray, that's a, a, a mid-tone gray. So I'm going to recompose my image so that that mid-tone gray is in the center of the image where the metering data is collected. Now I'm going to hold the AEL button down and recompose my image and the shutter speed won't change, or nor will the, the aperture. I take the image and now what's black is in real life will be black on film, what's white in real life will be white or light gray on film, and what's gray in real life will be gray on film. So some, some real life situations where that's useful are, let's say that you're, you're sitting at a, uh, an outdoor cafe in San Francisco or something, and you're sitting in the shade of a building, but behind you is a nice building you'd like to get in a picture. So there you are, you have your significant other sitting in front of you, and a nice building or the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that back in the background. Well, if you just metered, then your significant other would be cast in shadows and very dark, while the scenery would be properly exposed. So what you can do is you can recompose to capture the subject that you want to have be properly exposed, your significant other, meter off that that person, hold the AEL button down, recompose, and take your picture and your your subject will be properly exposed and the background will be blown out, but that's okay because the subject is what we want to have be properly exposed. So let's change modes here and go to program oops too far. Go to program. Let's see if AEL mode works with program. So we'll cover the lens again one tenth of a second, release it, and it sure does. So AEL mode will work in aperture shutter uh, priority modes as well as program mode. It will not work in full manual because you have complete control over all the settings in full manual anyway, and you don't need to have auto exposure lock in full manual. Let's rewind the film. To rewind the film, you push down the rewind lock, release. That's it, it's rewound. We'll push in the back. And now this film is ready to go off and be developed. You can either load your next roll of film or call it a day. It, al it always assumes that you have loaded a roll of film. So it will always take four pictures to advance the film whenever you close the back of the camera. Uh, a couple of other quick things here to talk about interface wise. Here is the autofocus manual focus button. So if you switch this, then you're going to be in autofocus. And to autofocus, you just have to press the shutter button and it will try to autofocus. In manual focus mode, then you have the ability to manually focus. And this is really good if you want to selectively pick a subject and your autofocus is not agreeing with you about what should be in focus. Uh, some special features about this camera. It has some nifty special features in it. One is that the autofocus system uses a dedicated system flash, uh, the program flash bodies, not built into the camera, but uh, available as a Minolta option that uses a near infrared light source to assist the autofocus. And I believe that it's either picked up the IR here or in the camera body. But the flash uh, system for, for night photography uses a near infrared light to help the autofocus figure out what is supposed to be in focus before the flash goes off. Uh, on this camera there is a bulb mode. Let's go into manual focus, or man full manual rather, and we'll go all the way back down to bulb, which is at the end of 30 seconds. Another interesting feature about this camera is that because the, the lenses have chips in them, the camera knows what lens is on the camera as well as what focal le length you're set to. So it will give you a slow shutter speed warning, and that varies by lens. So for wide angles, which is, for instance, 35 millimeters and a lower number, the slow shutter speed warning starts at 1 30th of a second. 
for standard lenses, which is about 43 millimeters out to about 70, then the, the slow shutter speed warning is 1 60th. And for telephotos, which is really anything about 85 millimeters and beyond, the slow shutter speed warning is 1 1 25th. That said, uh, the, the best rule of thumb to use for hand holding a camera is not to use a shutter speed, which is slower in, in fractional number than the lens focal length. So for instance, one se 70, uh, 70 millimeter lens, 1 70th or, or 1 60th in reality is the slowest shutter speed you should attempt to hand hold that lens at. If you're using a 200 millimeter lens, 1 200th of a second is the slowest shutter speed that you should attempt to hand hold that lens with. And one other thing about the light meter in this camera, the whole thing wakes up with what is described as a gentle caress of the shutter button. And you don't have to actually partially push it down, which is good because that prevents you from actually accidentally taking pictures. So all you have to do when the screen goes off to get the meter back on and the screen back on is just gently touch the, the shutter release button like that. So if you do have the shutter release button, the shutter release, and you would like to shoot in bulb mode, uh, bulb is only available in manual and it's easiest with the, with the uh, release. It can be done with either the release or with the shutter button, but it is decidedly much easier with the corded release. Uh, in bulb mode, which is the uh, film count window provides a timer. You can see it counting up. That is how many seconds that the bulb has been open. And it counts up in 99 second cycles for timing, meaning that when it hits 99, then it resets to zero. And that's really good if you're trying to do a long exposure and you need to calculate shutter reciprocity or film reciprocity rather, and you forgot your watch, which I've done. Bulb time is limited by battery power because the shutter is operated by the batteries. And what that means is that with the AAA batteries, you could get about four hours of bulb time. With the AA's, you could get about nine hours. And who knows, with the 2CR5 uh, CR battery, I couldn't find that anywhere online, uh, it has significantly more power. So really, the 2CR5 2 CR battery is going to last longer than the night uh, for bulb exposures, unless you're in Alaska in the winter. Another thing about the autofocus in this camera is that in autofocus mode, you have autofocus hold. So what that means is that you focus the subject that you want to take the picture of in the central or only autofocus point, half to press the shutter, and keep half to pressing it. This will prevent the autofocus from refocusing on something else. This allows you to focus and recompose and finish the shutter press without releasing the autofocus to take a picture of something else. Now that's useful if you want to take a picture, let's say that looks like this, okay? Let's pretend that this is a good picture. You want this to be in focus, but if you were to just take a picture, this is what would be in focus because it's what's in the central AF point. So you would compose your image, hold down your autofocus lock like that, which would lock onto here, recompose your image, and then take the picture, and this would still be in focus. It would not autofocus now on the subject, which is on something which is behind the subject. Next thing we're going to do is take a look at what you see through the viewfinder. All right, so we're going to look through the viewfinder here, and let's take a look at the screen down below. So, on the so on the left of the LCD, you can see the M that tells you your mode. So I'm going to change. There we go. So I'm going to change the mode: full manual, aperture priority, program, and shutter priority. And you can see it tells you what your shutter speed is. There we go, as well as your aperture. Over on the left, you can see those blinking red triangles. Now what that's telling you is that it's not in focus. In manual mode, it will have blinking red triangles. I'm going to go into autofocus mode. And I don't think I'm going to be able to get it to show up because I'm too close. There we go. That green circle tells you that you have your subject in focus. There we go. Oh, and it's also working in manual mode now. 
So out of focus is the red triangles, in focus is the green circle. So as we saw through the viewfinder, that this camera has the stock screen. It is a super minimalist screen having only the rectangle for the center autofocus point. It is incredibly well designed. In fact, uh, this was so well designed that Hasselblad contracted Minolta to design screens for the Hasselblad systems. So we saw the arrows in the circle. Uh, let's talk about what those mean. When the left arrow, the one that points this direction, is solid in autofocus mode, your image is not yet in focus. When both arrows are blinking in autofocus mode, that means your image can, or your subject cannot be autofocused on. Either it's too close, or for some other reason, it cannot be autofocused. When you see the green dot in the center, that means that your autofocus image is in focus. In manual focus mode, typically the two red arrows are supposed to just blink. Um, but we did get it to have the green dot on that, that one time, so I'm not sure exactly uh, why that was. Maybe if it was just a holdover from AF mode. So that is it for how to use this camera. Wow, there is a good amount to this, but guess what? It's still a pretty accessible camera, and it's fairly easy to use, and it is definitely user focused so it's not one that's impossible or overly difficult to use if this video was helpful please give me a thumbs up that lets me know i'm on the right track and that i'm making content which is useful and helpful to you if you have other questions about the minolta uh, maxim 7000 or photography or things like that please leave them in the questions below and i'm pretty good about responding and i fairly expedient uh, time. If you have ideas for other videos, feel free to leave those as a suggestion, and if I have the equipment and technical know-how to make those, I'm more than happy to. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, to my channel, feel free to. There's a subscribe button down here. And one last thing before we go, thank you guys for watching.